years ago, Matthew Duman embarked on a grotesque safari, trekking thousands of miles to 10 American institutions of higher education in search of their most fascinating architectural sculpture. At last, he returned with hundreds of images, revealing the grotesque secrets of the Grotesque 10, amazing architectural sculpture from 10 <laughs> American colleges and universities. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Grotesque Ted. My name is Matthew Duman, and you might be wondering why I'm dressed like this. Well, that's because I'm going to take you on a grotesque safari to a place where you can observe the behavior of gargoyles and grotesques in their natural habitat. In other words, the American college campus. So let's get started. Now this grotesque sculpture is particularly interesting because while it is meant to look ancient, it can possess modern concepts and themes. It can be found on a style of architecture called collegiate Gothic, a revival of the Gothic architectural style of medieval Europe, yet was actually popular in American colleges in the mid 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, what schools make up this grotesque 10? Well, I'm glad you asked, because there are a variety. Some were founded in the 19th century, but even a few from the 18th, and all possess some form of architectural sculpture on their campus buildings. The 10 schools featured in my book are Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, Duke University in North Carolina, Northwestern University in Illinois, Princeton University in New Jersey, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, the City College of New York in New York City, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, the University of Chicago in Illinois, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and because I keep finding new sculpture there even after years of exploring, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Now, why did college architects look backward for inspiration when designing academic buildings? Well, not surprisingly, a big reason was financial. Even the oldest colleges in North America are new compared to the old world institutions of Europe. American colleges also lack the cultural status that those of Europe had. And 150 years ago, our universities were not looked upon with the nostalgia and respect that they are today. Reviving venerable building traditions like Gothic was a great way to create an unspoken connection with the long established universities of Europe. This connection elevates the status and prestige of American colleges and society, and in turn, their endowments and donations as well. Many historic architectural styles, there are, actually there are many his, um, historic architectural styles, so why choose Gothic for your college campus? Well, by the mid 19th century, the industrial revolution was in full swing. Though there are many positive advancements due to industrialization, many came to see mass production as a threat to individuality and individual craftsmanship. Gothic was seen to celebrate the individual and individual expression. Think of the distinction between something that's handmade versus something that's mass produced. There are many interesting features of Gothic buildings. But my favorite feature is grotesques. Putting sculpted decoration on collegiate Gothic buildings is a direct extension of the Gothic traditions of European architecture. Many early collegiate Gothic buildings have grotesques featuring medieval imagery, such as this king from the University of Chicago. Another way to strengthen the connection between the institutions of the new and the old world. In architectural terms, a grotesque is a sculpted decoration on or in a building, and usually is representative of a human, animal, or a fanciful creature usually with features ex exaggerated to the point of caricature. A gargoyle is one type of, gr of grotesque. This is a specific kind which is used to channel rainwater off of the roof and away from the building, so as to protect the masonry from erosion. So basically it's a decorative rain spout, hence the modern verb to gargle. Now I've come up with seven types of breeds of grotesque based on their subject matter. A basic breed of grotesque is the historic variety. They portray something about the history of their building, its area of study, the school, town, state, or even country. At the back of Yale's Sterling Memorial Library, 
two reliefs depict similar occurrences, but set 212 years apart. Yale was founded in 1701 in Brantford, Connecticut. The school built a college house in New Haven in 1718. So one relief depicts the, the transport of Yale's books via ox cart to the new building in New Haven in 1718, while the other portrays the unloading of books from a gasoline powered truck for, to the newly built Sterling Memorial Library in 1930. Demonstrative grotesques simply depict some aspect of the purpose of their building. Howe's Chapel is part of the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary on the campus of Northwestern in Illinois. The Finneon's roof depicts two hands clasped together in prayer, a preview of the activity commonly found inside the chapel. The demonstrative grotesque seems a pretty straightforward concept, but things can get confusing as time moves on and buildings change their function. Rosenwald Hall serves as the admissions building, but began life as home to the Department of Geology. This explains the relief portraying a saddlebag with rock hammers, fossils of sea life, and the slogan, dig and discover below it. Legion Gothic buildings can also have the, the breed of grotesque that convey their meaning through allegory and symbols, as in the front of Northwestern University's Deering Library where allegorical grotesques teach time-honored lessons, like a winged hourglass for time flies, or a tortoise that crawls slowly past a sleeping hare, recalling Aesop's fable and proclaiming that haste makes waste. Important breed of grotesque is those of the school spirit variety. It usually consists of a representation of the school's mascot or another symbol relating to the institution's identity. Tr Trinity's mascot is the Bantle, a particularly stubborn and scrappy rooster, and its likenesses can be found flanking the archway at the Downs Memorial Clock Tower. This gentleman is not the City College of New York's mascot, but he is displaying the school seal. And Handsome Dan the Bulldog is Yale's mascot. He can be found many places on Yale's campus, like looking out from his doghouse at Polly Murray Residence College. And judging by the, sh the state of his bowl, I think he wants to be fed. One of my favorite breeds is the facetious grotesque or the funny ones. I have to say when writing this book, I intentionally left this, this section for last, assuming that would be the easiest one to write about because I find it the most enjoyable. However, when it came time to write this section, I quickly realized the huge distinction between telling a joke and ex explaining a joke. In my first attempt, I was trying to explain these grotesques, dissecting their message and at the same time, stripping out all of the humor. So I'll let these, I let this, this type of grotesque speak for themselves, like this less than literate demon on Princeton University's Dillon Gymnasium, or this drunken patriot on the University of Pennsylvania's residence quadrangle. You know, now that I think of it, this might have some of the historic grotesque in it, if this is supposed to represent a drunken Ben Franklin. Another personal favorite of mine are those grotesques that are just plain bizarre. The facetious grotesques are attractive because they make us laugh and feel good. But what makes these bizarre grotesques so attractive? Well, here's my theory. From childhood, we humans are taught to believe that every question has an answer and every puzzle a solution. When we come upon puzzles such as these grotesques, they become inherently interesting to us because we get preoccupied with finding their meaning, even when there may be no meaning to find like this baby ape in short pants on Washington University's Macmillan Hall. And I just don't know what to say about this one at the University of Pennsylvania's residence quadrangle. The spikes were put on the cornice, that's just so birds don't land on the cornice, but I don't know what they were thinking when they sculpted this one. The final breed of grotesque is one that by its very nature gets little attention, and that's the reclusive breed. It's a type of architectural Easter egg and sneaks by most people. They can be as simple as abstract animals hiding in the decoration, like these, these abstracted tiger's heads. The tiger is Princeton's mascot hiding in the core of Jones Hall. Or at Trinity, where you can find a rabbit and a monk carved underfoot into the flagstones of the floor of the cloisters at the chapel. Now that you know the gen general types of the grotesque, let's have a look at the few from each school of the grotesque ten. Penn's expansive residence quadrangle is known by some as the quad tannic. 
Now, when I first heard this, I said, well, that's obvious. It's a huge, sprawling, ornately decorated dormitory complex. It covers almost three city blocks, and the west end of the quad comes to a point like the prow of a ship. But the, no, as I found out, that's not why I was given the nickname. It was originally given the nickname the Quad Tannic by its maintenance staff, and that's because the basement always floods when it rains. One of my personal favorites at Penn is this guy at the quad. He's also on the cover of my book. This head is over four feet tall and mounted on the wall of a tunnel. These metal bars on either side meet to hold a, a lantern directly in front of the sculpture. I would imagine that encountering the sculpture under harsh light late at night would be pretty unsettled. I would also note the smaller wacky faces on either side. In another building, the Evans Museum and Dental Institute, there are many grotesques on its walls, and some are a reminder of a time before painless dentistry. These statues are part of a series of four on the gates of the Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. They were sculpted by Alexander Calder, not the artist who sculpted the abstract mobiles from pieces of metal, rather his father, Alexander Sterling Calder, who had a more realistic style. These are symbolic of the four regions of the earth in which the museum draws its artifacts. Pictured here on the left is Africa and on the right, North America. Many grotesques line the entrance arches of Deering Library at Northwestern University. Some are allegorical grotesques, illustrating Aesop's fables. One fable represented is called the old and the young rat. According to this fable, a cunning old rat, portrayed at the left, finds a trap baited with delicious cheese. He kindly offers it to a naive young rat, shown at the right. The young rat is killed when he springs the trap while trying to retrieve the cheese, leaving it available for the old rat to enjoy. The moral, do not blindly accept gifts. One also notice the, um, the books under the trap, suggesting this fable is set in Deering Library itself. Another fable represented is called the Old Woman in the Jug. According to this fable, <clears throat> an elderly woman who really likes wine finds a wine jug by the side of the road. To her disappointment, it's empty but it still contains the delightful fragrance of wine that it once held. While the moral is listed as the memory of a good deed lives on, I think a person who is sniffing empty containers she finds on the side of the road has some deeper issues. These grotesques do not represent fables. During library was designed as a place for serious study, portrayed on the left, but a browsing room was included so students could read for amusement as well, implied by the jester's outfit on the right. Duke University's West Campus is a beautiful example of collegiate Gothic architecture. The Philadelphia architecture firm of Horace Trumbauer designed this section of campus during the 1930s. The firm's lead designer, Julian Abiel, who actually designed most of these buildings, was African-American. He worked from Philadelphia and never traveled to Duke's campus to see his creations because he was, oppo he was opposed to the Jim Crow laws that were still in effect in North Carolina at the time. The cigarette in this laughing grotesque mouth is not part of the sculpture, but that is how I found it. Because the Duke family built much of its fortune from the tobacco trade, I thought it was appropriate, so I left it in. On the rear of Duke's original medical school building, you can find this horrified student. I like to think this represents a first year medical student observing his first cadaver dissection. The vestibule in the residence quadrangle has a series of allegorical grotesques that convey an important overall message, that of hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and think no evil. Taken individually, they're merely classical heads sporting vague hand gestures. But these enhance the meaning of one another by being located so close and together imply a theme, the four ways to avoid the many temptations inherent in college life. East Pine Hall, constructed in 1897, was among the first of Princeton's collegiate Gothic buildings. To show how serious the school was about the style of their buildings, Princeton's campus planners had to threaten to fire the architect, William Potter, when he wanted to build it in a different style. 1879 Hall has lots of mischievous monkeys. 
These are not demonstrative grotesques. There are never any actual monkeys here. These are allegorical grotesques, depicting students as under-evolved primates, annoying a professor who is portrayed as human. This shows that Princeton professors have themselves evolved from rambunctious students. Princeton's Graduate College has these joyriding sweethearts roaring down the road in the newfangled motor car. A goose and a pig leap to get out of the way of their tires. They were called the modern youth in a New York Times article from 1927 because both were smoking. Now their cigarettes have long since broken off, <clears throat> but the New York Times headline remains that of girl gargoyle smokes. And how about these ghoulish grotesques? The decapitation on the right and the tongue twister on the left on Jolene dormitory live up to what you'd expect of the word grotesque. This image shows Brookings Hall from the Cloy Tower from Brookings, Brookings Hall Tower from the cloisters at Ridgely Hall. Brookings Hall is a school's administration building. It has some surprisingly bizarre grotesques, such as this one that's called the dragon and his unfortunate victim. This grotesque is located over the Ann Olin Women's Building and is of the school spirit breed. And you could, you could see the, um, the school's motto, which translates from Latin to shrink through truth. But this is located right over the entrance. So if you stand right outside the entrance doors and look up you can and see the underside of this grotesque, you can see it hides a, hides a reclusive one, a beskirted yet mustachioed monster. Like many European Gothic cathedrals, Washington University's Graham Chapel has religious carvings on the inside, but these are balanced by many bizarre grotesques, depicting the alternative to heaven on the outside. This image shows Northam Towers, part of a series of buildings at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, called the Long Walk, as seen from the chapel cloisters. The Long Walk buildings were the first buildings to be constructed on this site in 1878, and only a small part of the original plan. One of these, Seabury Hall, has this two-headed grotesque by an entrance. It portrays male and female graduates commemorating 25 years of co-education at Trinity. The school began admitting, began admitting women in 1969, so this grotesque dates from 1994. So some Trinity build, buildings were built with blank spots for later carving. You can see other blanks in the towers of the chapel. Sadly, the Great Depression caught up with Trinity as it was completing construction on the chapel. So there was not enough money to complete the entire plan. So some grotesque ornament was scrapped in favor of more other, more practical aspects of the design. However, inside the chapel is a different story. There are many sculpted pewins inside and every element of these carvings are important in conveying their identity. This pewin finial might've looked like the small figure of a woodsman but thanks to the sense of scale provided by the trees surrounding him, he is quickly identified as the enormous figure of Paul Bunyan. Another commemorates the chapel's primary donor, William Mather, whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower. It portrays a group of William's forebears kneeling in prayer, thanking God for their safe journey to the new world. And you could see the Mayflower at anchor in the background. But what are those two figures in the middle ground? I'll zoom in. A settler, armed with a rifle, chases a Native American. This is based on a pun that William once told, in which he joked that his ancestors were of the sword who, immediately after coming ashore, they fell upon their knees in prayer. Then they fell upon the Aborigines. Mather lived in a less than PC time. The University of Chicago's first campus architect, Henry Ives Cobb, gifted this gate to the school. He always had limitations imposed on him by the university trustees when designing campus buildings. However, since he used his own money for the gate, he was generous with the grotesque ornament by, by including these creatures ascending the roof. Now there is one, <coughs> there is one uh, theory as to what these mean, and it goes something like this. When you first come to the University of Chicago, you, as a student, you first have to get by the admissions officer, shown at the lower left. Then as you ascend the ranks of the school and thereby ascending the roof, you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, and then finally a senior at the very top on the right. Originally home to the Department of Geology, 
Rosenwald Hall has two representations of the moon, each with a human character representing its age. One version on the right, the moon is shown with a child. Like the child, the moon is young and therefore has a smooth surface. This is contrasted by an older moon, represented with an elderly man on the left. His moon is older, so its surface has a heavy accumulation of craters. The International Building provides housing for international students. One relief depicts the flow of people from different cultures from the old world to the new by a steamship. And to the right side of the arch is a primitive man. I mean, a, to the left side of the arch is a primitive man holding a club. And on the right, a modern educated scholar holding a book. The City College of New York was founded as a social experiment in 1847. The school was totally funded by taxpayers, so tuition was free and admission was based solely on academic merit. For this reason, the school was originally nicknamed the Harvard of the Proletariat. However, based on buildings like Shepherd Hall here, the school was recently given a more modern nickname, that of Hogwarts in Manhattan. And if this is Hogwarts, this must be Dumbledore on a bad day. Elsewhere, an ornithologist measures the bird skeleton and a geologist ponders crystals. At the top of one of Shepherd Hall's towers, an astronomer has caught a falling star. Note the telescope in his left hand. These original buildings were constructed in the early 1900s. Notice these grotesques seem in very good condition for being exposed for more than 100 years. The secret, well, the secret is, the grotesques on the City College of New York buildings are not the originals. Here are, oh, here are some of the originals. They consisted of terracotta covered in a thick, glossy glaze. From the beginning, no one liked the glossy finish, so that all the grotesques were sandblasted to a matte finish. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, this time the sandblasting created thousands of mini cracks in the finish, which allowed moisture to seep in and begin to destroy the grotesques through repeated freezing and thawing. By the 1970s, these grotesques were falling apart. Starting in the 1980s, all the sculpture was taken down. Durable replacements were cast and put up. The originals were put into storage and in the early 2000s, some were placed next to the school's architecture building. So near a parking area next to Spitzer Hall is a graveyard of some of the, of some of the City College of New York's original grotesques. Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr College is a women's college founded in 1888 and determined to be a direct competitor to men's colleges. Important among the methods to achieve this goal was the construction of a Gothic campus. Pembroke Hall is held in high esteem as one of the finest collegiate Gothic structures in the country. This relief is a reference to Pembroke College at Oxford, which was named for William Herbert, the third Earl of Pembroke. Note the shield at the center with, th with the three lions, the Herbert family crest. And across the bottom, the French phrase and Herbert family motto, which translates to, I will serve only one. The cloisters of the old library are encircled with many creatures, such as these two with leathery bat-like wings. Now, the owl is Bryn Mawr's mascot and many versions of it can be seen on Rockefeller Hall. Here, one owl interrupts another's reading or these owls attending class. I guess I was interrupting an important lesson when I took this photo. The collegiate, oh, sorry. Yale University is an example of a, an historic university that has developed in conjunction with the surrounding city of New Haven, Connecticut. A few years after its founding in 1701, Yale moved to New Haven. This means from 1718 on, the school and city grew simultaneously. After 300 years, Yale's campus has become enmeshed in the fabric of New Haven. So Yale uses architectural styles like collegiate Gothic to visually separate its buildings from those of the surrounding city. This is the tower of Yale's law school. When you see it, you immediately know it's part of Yale because the only similar buildings in New Haven are other Yale buildings. Plus you couldn't mistake this for an office building or a bank. The collegiate Gothic style faded in the 1930s in favor of other more abstract styles, but it didn't totally disappear. Yale completed two residence colleges in 2017, both in the collegiate Gothic style. 
on Ben Franklin Residence College, you can find this series of portraits. Who are they? Well, the, answer in this, the key to answering this lies in the abstract relief at the center. It looks like a photo, you, it looks like a satellite photo you might see on Google Maps or MapQuest. Look at the building in the center. Its rounded porch may look familiar. This is an overhead view of the White House city block in Washington, DC. The why within the White House identifies these, uh, these portraits as those of various Yale alumni who've occupied it. Going counterclockwise from the left, you have the 27th president, William Taft, the 38th president, Gerald Ford, the 41st president, George Bush Sr., the 42nd president, Bill Clinton, and the 43rd president, George Bush Jr. This relief decorates the outside of Polly Murray College's lounge and depicts the hamburger as was originally intended by its creator, New Haven's Lewis Lesson of Louis' lunch, on toast without ketchup. And this, pizza, this pizza peel holds two slices. From the arrangement of the toppings, one can tell these slices come from two famous New Haven pizzerias, that of Peppy's and Sally's. And personally, I like the use of the pepperoni slices as periods. Polly Murray College alludes to the early days of computing by referencing computer pioneer and Yale alum, Grace Hopper. She coined the term computer bug when she found a moth had short-circuited her, short her computer. And modern computing is portrayed by this electronic tablet. And personally, I think it's, a, it's an iPad, considering the shape of the home button at the bottom. These are just a few of the examples of what I found at these campuses. My book has 300 pages and over 500 photos, so there are many, many more. By its generous use of ornament, Collegiate Gothic is an example of the many opportunities to find intriguing things that can exist all around us. Things that, we're, that we may overlook every day. Things that, upon closer inspection, can reveal a variety of fascinating ideas and stories. What I wanted to accomplish by assembling these images is show a few of the amazing things you can find by merely noticing the detail around you. Not just blindly accepting the way things are, but asking why things are the way they are. So look around you. You might find interesting things literally coming out of the woodwork like these old chums at Trinity's Chapel in Hartford, Connecticut. My book, The Grotesque Ten, is available at thegrotesque10.com and on Amazon. And you can email me at matthew.duman at thegrotesque10.com. That's Matthew with one T. So that's my lecture. Is there, is there any questions or? Um, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, the people who design the the gargoyles are or grotesque. Are they? Do they work for the architect? Does it? How, who decides what's going to? Well, be put it's, there. It's largely is dependent on the importance of the building. Like um, at Yale, Sterling Memorial Library is a huge library. It's the centerpiece of the university. So. So they actually had a committee of people and they had this at the University of Chicago when they were designing the buildings. They had a committee made up of the architects and the masons and people, representatives from the university. So they all could decide on what kind of iconography went on the building. Now there are other buildings that are maybe less important, dorms and that sort of thing, where they would, sometimes they would let the masons do whatever they wanted. So it really depended on the importance of the building. Okay. I wanted to find out why did you pick up this interest? Why, why gargoyles? Why grotesque? Well, when I was in, I went to the grotesque free campus of Central Connecticut State University. And there's nothing like this <laughs> there, no Gothic buildings. But while I was there, I did an exchange program and with, and I studied at the University of Central Lancashire. In, right outside of Manchester, England. And I loved all the, the old architecture there. And, but at the time I really wasn't into photography. I didn't have a good, great camera. So then when I came back, I found myself working in New Haven and I wanted to, and I was into photography. So I wanted to, um, a personal, some personal project to get, to get me going on photography. So I knew Yale had great buildings. I hung around there a lot growing up. So, I started walking around Yale and I started taking pictures and 
when I zoomed in, I started seeing all these sculptures and things that I'd never noticed before. I always thought, I'd heard Yale had, had sculpture, and I always thought they would be um, his, stuffy and historical, but these are, they're funny and there's social commentary and there's a lot more to them. So that really got me interested. And I started take, taking more and more pictures. And so, so finally I decided to do a book and my first book was just about Yale. And while, when I was doing programs like this to promote it, people would always come up to me and suggest other schools I, I could go to, University of Chicago at Duke. And I got real curious as to what was out there. So I started traveling and, and go to all these other schools. Um, just a quick, are, are they still adding these sculptures? I mean, like that, the idea of the tablet and et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, yeah, that there were still spaces and they'd run out of money, but. Yeah. Yes, it's not, it's not as common as it once was. Mm -hmm. and there's not as many people who can do this sort of thing. Right. But they, they still do. Um, sometimes they have, and I, I was surprised when I found out they have sculptors who will sculpt these, they call it in situ, which they'll climb up a tower and, and pound out a sculpture, which seems pretty mm -hmm. amazing. I thought they were all done on the ground and lifted up there, but mm -hmm. some of them are, are sculpted in that in situ. So yes, they're, they're still sculpting. And all those ones I showed you,